guys sorry about that we had a little bit of glitch happening but if you're um hopefully you guys come back so we were just talking about how to clean up um spores and we're starting to field some live q a so let's go live on tiktok Welcome back. Sorry for any um, glitchiness that just happened. It kicked us off, but we are back live and we are taking Q and A. Um, we're here with Zach from Mushroom Cult. We just talked about our classes and how we learn, um, and then we were talking about some projects that we were doing, and then we got kicked off YouTube. So. Um, thanks for joining us back, and if you guys have any more questions, or um, I guess another, the next question that we got in was, what's the best media for cordyceps? So in the wild, they grow on insects, so I would say that's probably the best media, um, just because it's the most natural, but then um, as a commercial grower, you'd want to get something that is easy to replicate over and over again and is uh, very uh, affordable. So a lot of people use rice. Um, I recently switched over to wild birdseed substrate. Um, it's just one complete substrate that you have to hydrate properly. So it's a little bit difficult to get a nice um, moisture content, but um, I feel like the less steps involved the better but there are a lot of recipes out there um, the cordyceps cultivation handbook has a, a whole list of different substrates you can use and i have tried a handful of them my favorite from that book was the moo moo substrate so it was just a uh, milk cow milk and rice that seemed to produce some pretty good fruits um what are your thoughts on cordyceps um yeah i've just done rice with uh what was the recipe it had kelp and it had uh, some like glacial rock dust and um, i haven't played with a lot of different substrates so i'm not sure what all the difference is but you know if you look at the recipes for them they're really widely varied like some have eggs some have milk some have all these exotic minerals some of them have really complicated mixes and um, it, it, that just seems strange to me. Strange to me that there's such a gigantic, wide variety of really complicated mixes. Um, and you know, you can also grow it on just plain rice. But you know, you'll get you'll get varying results. All right. Um, could you guys give us a thumbs up if you can hear? We had some glitchiness happen, and I'm not sure if our audio is coming through now. Someone says. Can't hear anything. Having lots of problems today. <laughs> it's rusty. All right. How are Morchell experiments going? So I just planted them. So I would say they're going well, but there's really not anything to um, observe. So this audio is working. Maybe I'll just try unplugging this one. All right, guys, can you hear us on TikTok? Give us a thumbs up if you can hear us. Um, there's some audio problems. All right. Sounds like we're good. So hopefully mm -hmm. uh, the internet is in our favor. We missed. If you guys missed, um, we were just talking about how Zach and I are going to start our classes again soon. So um, the schedule is up on mushroomcult.net. We're doing in-person classes. They are almost sold out or did that november class sell out um, there's still one slot in november one slot in november sold out. december sold out and the other ones are are on sale yeah so um if you want to take an in-person class and learn everything you need um to grow mushrooms we're going to be doing them in denver we have a you know a really dialed in two-day schedule and it goes through everything from spore all the way through fruiting and you get to um, make all the materials that you'll be using and then you get to take it all home so it's a really fun class and I'm excited and 
Um, we are taking some questions. Um, if you guys have any specific questions on how to grow mushrooms, uh, just let us know. So it looks like we are getting some people on TikTok too. So I can't speak that language. Um, all right, so. All right, so someone's bringing to my attention some of the, the dangers of growing mushrooms outdoor. So mice and snails are definitely a big concern. Um, I just tried to mitigate that by, I guess, having cats, and I built, like, this raised bed around the, the bed, or a, like a wooden box around it to prevent snails, but that's going to happen. Um, that's why I prefer to grow mushrooms indoors. But um, something that you yeah. might want to think about trying for the snails is um, you can put in like an electric fence. It, if you if you electrify a mm -hmm. a wire border, like maybe nail it to your wood so that it's not so it doesn't ground. Mm -hmm. um, they will touch it and they'll stop crossing it. You can kind of teach them not to go in. Cool. Maybe uh, raise that up a little bit to prevent mice from getting into it too. Just mm -hmm. electrification. That's uh, that's the way to go. Shocking. Yeah. All right. Cool. So nice comment about the morel patch. So if anyone else has experience on that, um, Zach briefly described his method for cultivating morel. So I'm gonna give him a block, and he's gonna bury it, and then do a external nutrient source so the the way that i'm doing it is i'm going to have the spawn on top and the nutrients are kind of mixed in the soil and then my hopes are that it will go into the soil and pin whereas his idea was bury the spawn in the soil and then put the nutrients on top so it will have to travel and then hopefully form fruits around that um, they are pretty miraculous mushrooms um, I still think it's amazing that we can even find them out there. Um, but yeah, so any other questions? Morcella mycelium growing together with bacteria. So yes, there are some pseudomonas that are known to grow in uh, symbiosis with the morcella. Um, you can look up the papers on that my understanding that they kind of shepherd the bacteria so they'll produce enzymes that will um, promote the growth of certain pseudomonas and that's how they establish their relationship so hopefully there's just enough random bacteria in the soil that they'll kind of find their way and shepherd those bacteria that they need to grow um, otherwise you can do a wash which that's what i did last year um, I just didn't keep up that culture. They're very sensitive, and I put it in the fridge, and it didn't grow. So um, one thing to be aware, when you're growing bacteria, maybe you want to always have a, a, a healthy liquid culture to keep that going instead of uh, putting it in the fridge. But live and learn. All right, so someone's talking about the Chinese method, which that's what I'm attempting to replicate. Do you watch Everyman Bio? Um, yeah, I recently subscribed. I haven't watched very many of the videos, maybe one of them. Uh, that's something I'm pretty interested in, but haven't jumped into because uh, I just don't want to get the whole toolkit yet. Um, all the. Yeah, so I've never heard of him. Kits. But um, yeah, so bioengineering, I guess that implies CRISPR Cas9. Or just plasmid mm -hmm. um, transfers but I am interested in that I just don't have the infrastructure so that's a long-term goal of but mine. that guy's doing in his living room yeah what infrastructure we can do this in our living room <laughs> kind <laughs> of <I'm just> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so I come from a, a, a medical lab background and my ideas I guess are just a little bit too more too precise but CRISPR is fairly easy. Um, I would just like to be able to 
run the sequencing um, and there's the the mini PCR kit you can get which I haven't purchased yet it's uh, coming down the pipeline but when you run a business you have to have priorities so I just acquired some space and now I'm gonna build a, a new Quonset building and I'm going through all the permitting right now to get that done which is um, you know you got to have your ducks in a row and then Hopefully next spring I'll be able to fruit mushrooms there and then I have like this five or ten year vision of what it's going to look like and somewhere along the line I want to get some some lab equipment unless someone is uh, kind enough to lend us some <laughs> um, but that's a kind of a long-term project for now I'm just focusing on cultivation and uh, breeding so I'm going to be doing a extensive breeding project which is very low tech but i would love to start cat um cataloging all the different genetics i just don't have uh the the tools yet to do that professional techniques but try to make them doable at home yeah so when you're doing pcr in your living room there is a huge risk for anti um antigens or I guess just dust particles that would be interfering with that PCR reaction. So I I question the legitimacy of this right off the bat, but I could be wrong and maybe he's very sterile in his living room. Um, it depends on what it looks like or if he has a flow hood. But my experience doing PCR, it has to be, you know, BSL-3. Any dust particle is going to interfere with that replication. So when you're using expensive reagents like Masters Mix, you want to do it correctly. Um, but I have not seen his videos, so I don't want to downplay anything that he's doing, which he could be doing a really good job. Um, I just I haven't seen it yet. Even when you're doing the PCR, even just having a little piece of the auger from the Petri plate, that can interfere with the genetic results. Mm -hmm. So we did mess around a couple times with that mini PCR kit, but... I feel like we had questionable results with the electrophoresis. There's so many things that could go wrong. So I I believe in the science, but I also believe in using the right tools. So that's kind of like building a house with a hammer and a nail. You can do it, but I would prefer, you know, the modern technologies of today so you can build a much better house. So that's my philosophy, but you know, it's really good to get people thinking about these things and you know, it says, is it muted? Is it Mine, muted? nobody's watching, maybe because the sound doesn't work. Mm. I don't know what's going on there. All right, so no sound. We're not getting sound on. Yeah. So the people are hearing it on YouTube. Yeah. So sorry, we're having some more technical difficulties. Um, shaggy mane are, are compost lovers so you can use sawdust but you'll want to have some sort of a, a compost and maybe you'd want to plant it outside because that's where they grow normally like in grassy areas um, all right guys can you hear us yeah mm. I don't know what's happening with the TikTok, but I'm going to end this one. All right. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, we'll just uh, focus on some of these questions coming in on YouTube. Someone says, I wrote to you a long time ago to work together in a scientific project about mushrooms and cancer. I don't remember seeing that. So maybe send me an email. Um, mushroomcult.net has my all my contact information um sorry i missed that i didn't i didn't notice that all right so someone asked too late too late in the season to inoculate outdoor beds in denver so i don't think so i have some king strafaria that i'm going to put another layer on on my current bed i've got some blue foot that i'm going to do within the next couple weeks so you're not going to get fruits this year, but you can still plant the mushrooms and then just water them in. 
And then when the springtime um, rains come, you should get some good flushes that way. What are your thoughts on um, doing logs or other outdoor um, projects? I feel like... Yeah, I mean, you, you probably want to give them enough time before it freezes. And we're getting... Here in Denver, we're getting surface frost. Like, a couple days ago, there was a good surface frost that killed some sensitive plants. But the soil is not going to freeze until it gets down into the 20s, which is not in the forecast anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, so there's still time for biology to grow. Um, but yeah, like if you're getting in towards like cold, cold winter, that might be a little too late to inoculate late. Uh, just wouldn't give it the best advantage. Yeah. All right, so some more questions coming in. Pleuratus ostriatus, so that's an oyster mushroom. Um, some people talking about some cubensis cultures. So good luck with that, your first grow. Just be prepared if, if you fail, um, but don't give up. How long do Prestos hold up? So I had I, one from the 70s. Yeah. So at least 50 years, <laughs> um, yeah. you might have to replace the, the O-ring or the the rubber seal. Mm -hmm. I've had to do that twice um, since I've had it, just since mm -hmm. I've been using it the last couple of years. Yeah, I did mess up one of them because I ran it dry. So you want to make sure you don't do that. And then the bottom like bowed out. But overall, they last a really long time. Someone asked the mushroom season. Yeah, the mushroom season, I mean, it still continues, I guess. Some people are finding oysters and a few other things. Enoki's a winter mushroom. Um, a couple weeks ago was, uh, I guess, like three three weeks ago, there was a lot of shaggy manes coming up. I mean, the season really continues until it's solid frozen. But um, it's basically over, like end of, Early September is usually when it ends in the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, early spring, February, March, you can find Enokis. You can start finding other cool season mushrooms. Um, but then, like, May and June, it gets big. July, End of July and August is, is really the season that everyone looks forward to. Mm -hmm. So someone asked uh, about the syringe filters. So reusing syringe filters, I've used mine for about a year straight now. Um, as long as they're not discolored or warped, I feel like you can use them. He actually manufactures these really nice mycology lids, which is our, our, on our Etsy, Fresh Fungi. Um, they have glass filter beads, so superior to the uh, Tyvek ones, and I haven't seen any kind of wear and tear on those the the thing that's starting to go is the injection ports so if you have any extra of those um i would like to swap some out yeah. but yeah as far as those glass filter the syringe filters they've lasted through at least i would say 12 or 13 autoclave runs and they're still working fine yeah they should work fine um i i like the the glass filter because it's not using um, the Teflon. Uh, Teflon is like one of those chemicals that it's a forever chemical. And I don't know, there's some links to cancer that seems like are trying to be covered up. It's, it's not something that I would want to spend money on and encourage that business, like all the, all the non-stick things. Um, so glass, I like glass. Glass is reusable. It's comes from a natural source. You can use sand. That's not good for concrete for glass. Yep. So, what about those uh, little? They were like the add-on um, pieces of silicone. The remember that one lid that you made that is uh -huh. like the media extractor. Yeah. So I've had trouble getting the parts that I need. Like I have yeah. a surplus of some of the parts, and some of the other parts are difficult to get. So that kind of put me on hold on mm -hmm. on. Um, working with the extractors very much um, I should probably look into it again and see if the the parts are available all right so someone 
can oyster mushrooms digest self-healing injection boards? So I don't, I don't think so, but. It depends. I guess it depends what you're using, like a silicone. Yeah, I don't know what it's made of. Like, yeah, there's several different varieties, and I do see um, mycelium growing on them and, and in that little um, cavity, mm -hmm. but I don't know that it's actually digesting it. Um, but, you know, mushrooms are resourceful. They mm -hmm. are factories of, of an incredible chemical language that takes apart the world around it. Um, so that it wouldn't be a surprise to me that they could eat plastic or various rubbers. Mm. Um, if it's made of some sort of a petroleum product, then yeah, oysters have been shown to eat petroleum product products. So, mm -hmm. um, feed it something else in your liquid culture. Eat something better. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> if it's eating your injection port, that's probably not the best recipe. All right. I wish these would just stay up. Um, don't understand the use of the syringe filter. So the jar or LC. All right, so maybe, yeah, we did do a video about the evolution of liquid culture last year. So if you want to go back and check out, I think it was like Fungi Friday number four or something. But I think you do a good job of explaining the whole displacement with I, yeah maybe i'll go grab one real quick okay yeah so what is a syringe filter um there are lots of different kinds of syringe filters it's a it's like a usually it's a plastic disc that inside has a filter membrane of some kind the ones i like to use are glass um, and they have different uh, pore sizes so you can filter different uh different products some of them are hydrophobic some are for hydrophilic so what they're generally manufactured for is putting on the end of a syringe and pulling a fluid through so that, you know, like, uh, for example, you could put it in blood and it would filter out the blood cells. So you might just get some of the, the plasma. I don't know if that's a actual use for it or not, but uh, you can filter out dirt. You can filter out, um, there's a test kit that you can use that you'd filter out mushroom tissue to um, pull off the reagents that are in there and it's a filter but when we're using it for as a mycology jar so here's here's the jar when you're using it as a mycology jar we're using it as an air filter although they're usually designed as uh, for filtering liquids of some kind um, so when you have a syringe this one is full of a liquid culture you can see the mycelium down there if you inject that into the jar and there's no air outlet it will pressurize the jar and you you could probably get the syringe out but depending on the size of the the container you might not be able to get the liquid into the jar because it pressurizes and if if your jar has a liquid in there but no air exchange you won't be able to pull the liquid out so a lot of people will drill holes and they'll put a polyfill in there or micropose has a has a little sticker that you can put on that has a filter or you can use a syringe filter, which is like a, a higher quality filtration. It's designed as a filter. And so it allows air in and out. As this amount of liquid goes into the jar, the same amount of air comes out of the jar. So that's that's the whole point of the syringe filter in this macology jar. But uh, like here you can see the, the needle is attached to the syringe. If you unscrew the needle, you can screw on, on the filter if you wanted to filter. If you didn't want the mycelium, you could filter the mycelium out through this syringe filter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so traditionally when you're making liquid media um, and you want it to be super clear, you can push the liquid media through a filter and it's going to filter out any contaminants or particles um, so some machines, like an HPLC machine, are very sensitive to particles. So you'd want to filter out your diluent or um, your solvents through a syringe filter. So there's many applications besides just in these mycology lids, which that could be confusing to people. Um, but for the purpose of these lids, it's mostly just to filter the air that's d being displaced. Yeah, I guess one note. We've had several students take the lid off their needle and put it into the syringe filter mm -hmm. because it's called a syringe filter this is a syringe put it in there but that's that's not right the injection port is for the syringe mm -hmm. so um 
I, I think I'm going to be calling these air filters for the class purposes because we don't want the needle touching any of this and we don't want to poke a hole in our filter. So the needle goes in the injection port, the self-healing injection port. It's like a rubber that it rips open when the needle goes in and when the needle comes out, it pinches back closed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can see I've probably used this about six or seven times now and it's still sealing but it's getting very dicey so i feel like you you'd have to replace these before these yeah and, and also when you're using one of these injection ports if you do it in the same spot every time it can enlarge the hole mm. if you move the needle a little bit to the side and go in a new area then you can extend the life of it a little bit um, but i i did a video on tiktok where i just jammed and jammed and jammed and i got about 40 40 stabs before it really wasn't working anymore. Mm -hmm. um, if you're careful and watching the orientation of the needle and carefully placing it in there, you can really extend the life to you know, tens or hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but great question. Um, those are the kind of questions that we like to, to go down. Cow pastures. Um. Yeah, so they introduce antibiotics in the feed these days to mitigate um i i think they mitigate fungus growth that way what are your thoughts on that um yeah so the question was can you take spores and spray it on straw or hay and uh, i mean the, the answer i guess is yes but that's not a good practice mm -hmm. like if you want to grow mushrooms from spores the idea would be to put it on auger, which is a, in, in a petri dish, use sterile um, material, sterile procedures and sterile materials, put it on the auger plate, make sure that it's clean, separate it from molds and bacteria, move it on to something like grain or liquid culture, and then you've increased your chances of success because you have active spores, you have mated spores, and you have clean spores, or, or maybe it's mycelium at this point. Um, then going on to spraying your prepared straw, you'll probably have a little bit more success. But if you take that liquid culture and then get it growing on something like grain or corn, um, and getting it really colonizing a nutrient source, then not only is it mycelium, but it also has a nutrient source. Then you're gonna have even better results if you put that on straw. And if you're trying to go outside, if you go from spores to auger to liquid culture to grain to straw and then you move that outside then you're going to have pretty good results outside because you've you've got the mycelium established and you've um, given it a nutrient source and the straw is not very palatable to mice and other animals especially when it has mycelium on it um, so you're you're setting it up for success if you just spray spores out um, if you have a lot of spores, like, go for it. But if you're trying to be successful, then that, that's really not a great route. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always been a dream of mine to get one of those uh, big trucks with the tanks for pesticides and just spray spores everywhere. So that m might work. Yep, yep. I mean, do that. Please do that. <laughs> All right, so someone says... Oops. What? are your preferred moisture ratios for grains and for substrates so i like 60 percent but anywhere between 60 and 65 percent are good the problem with the more moisture is that you'll have water pool up um but the on the drier side there's also problems with that too so i don't know it depends on the grains as well what is your preferred um, so I don't, I don't usually measure it. So um, what I do is I either soak it overnight or I bring it up to a boil and let it sit for you know 30 minutes to an hour or two, depending on the grain that I'm using, and make sure that it's fully hydrated, that the grain has absorbed as much moisture as it can, and that the outside isn't waterlogged. So maybe dry it off a little bit. Um, so I don't, mm -hmm. I don't bother measuring it. It's, uh, it's more of giving the grain the proper conditions to do its maximum hydration. Mm -hmm. And each batch is going to vary from batch to batch. So um, if 
kind of an approximation for me when I measure, but um, yeah, I mean, I feel like it can work in a huge range, like in the, in the wild, it could be really rainy or it could be super dry and you're still going to get mushrooms. Um, but yeah, my experience is 60%, but the more and more you do it, the more you're going to find your own personal preference. All right, so talking about brown rice flour. Yeah, if you haven't done the brown rice flour technique, you should definitely try. Um, so we, we, earlier we were talking about learning, and um, you can learn by listening to other people, and you can learn by doing the techniques that they that they share. So one of them is brown rice flour. If you're a professional laboratory person, you're a commercial grower, and you've never tried PF Tech or brown rice flour technique, you should try it because the experience is fascinating. It's a really simple method. It's kind of a brain stretcher. If, if your background is laboratory work and Petri dishes, it's really an out-of-the-box kind of method. Um, there's other methods like um, anaerobic digestion of, of like straw or wood that you can do outside without using sterile techniques. Um, try these new methods. Like if you read about something on the shroomery or on, uh, you see it on YouTube, even if it's wrong, even if it's stupid, try it and see what's wrong with it. Like experience what's wrong with it. Experience what's great with it. It's, uh, you need to keep learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of the easiest methods to learn. It's like pretty much foolproof. And you can use these mycology lids for that too. So you can do your cake and then reuse this to make the liquid culture from that clone and then you know there's a lot of tool out of this really simple contraption and everyone has a ball jar laying around so um, just make sure you get the straight ones and not the ones with the, the smaller lids but definitely worth checking out so someone asked about fungus gnats and I saw my first three this week since May so I had been combating them by just doing regular cleaning but eventually they're going to find your way in so what I do is I shut down everything for about a week or two once a year let it dry out completely and then they'll go away and then you have to be super diligent about any air that's coming in so you can battle that with positive pressure um, any any cultures that you're receiving or if you're taking in wild mushrooms to um, to clone them I always like leave them in a Tupperware for a few hours because any fungus gnats will come out and it's way you're kind of like quarantining that tissue and then also um, yellow sticky traps and whatever what what do you have in your tent I got it's a mosquito a, zapper a small yeah, mosquito those are zapper it, it's uh... It's not going to stop your problem, but it's kind of a way of monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use the sticky traps mostly as monitoring. That is not going to clean up your, your mm -hmm. grow room. But, um, you know, if you get a few on your fly trap, then you know what to do about it. There's, um, there's bacteria and mm -hmm. fungus that you can apply to your grow room mm -hmm. in order to kill them. Um, one interesting idea is on the, on the sticky trap, if you collect a bunch of flies on there, some of them might explode with with uh, fungus. Maybe collect that fungus and culture that out and use that as a spray. Um, something that's already killing the flies. Um, but yeah, my mosquito zapper is just sitting in the corner. It has UV light. It sort of attracts them, but the, they like the mushrooms more. Um, but yeah, cleaning. Uh, the, yeah. the thing that really fixed it was I cleaned it out. I gave it a few days to dry out and no mushrooms in there. I put the fly zapper in there and then I reintroduced clean mushrooms and it's kept it pretty clean. Yeah. So fungus gnats are the bane of existence for growing mushrooms, especially agaricus or any compost loving. They're, they're going to find their way in. So the best way to battle it is to prevent it. Um, but yeah, they're, I don't know. I feel like uh, nematodes is another option. Mm -hmm. I've done that before. Yep. All right. 
So someone asked about the Denver Mushroom Cooperative. Oh, um, don't go. Don't yeah. Go. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. So. What, what's the question? Uh, Denver Mushroom Cooperative? You yeah, see that? it was a few back. Um, it just I, said, what's I go, happening? I go to every one that I, that's on there. I think there was supposed to be one last week, but it, nobody posted anything. Yeah. So I don't know. Talk to Travis or, um, yeah, I think Travis is the one in charge of all that. But I think it's just getting a little cold because we were meeting outside and they lost one of the spaces that they were at because of COVID. And um, I mean, we're both interested in the Denver Mushroom Cooperative. It's just not, we don't run it. We're just participants. So um, reach out to Travis and he will tell you more information on that. Yeah, you can find him on Instagram or if you just look up Denver Mushroom Cooperative on Facebook or Instagram and send them a message, then they're fairly responsive. Um, expanding liquid cultures. How far can you expand before having senescence concerns? Mm, that's a good one. So, yeah, I think it just depends on the variety. Like cordyceps, they will only last a few months. And then I have oyster mushrooms that are fruiting super rigorously from three years ago. Um, and then as long as they're not contaminated, they could live in suspension for a really long time. But I feel like it just depends on the variety, number one, and then also the genetics within that variety. So that's something that I'm specifically trying to breed for when I'm making new strains. Um, but I mean, I've heard of people having liquid culture in one of these syringes and then inoculating it in 10 years later and it's still getting fruiting bodies so it it's very uh you know on a case-by-case basis are you asking because you've had a problem with this or are you just worrying about it because someone told you because and i don't think it's non-existent i'm but i'm kind of skeptical that it's as big of a deal as some people have made it Uh, if if you're dealing with a problem because of replicating again and again i would love to hear about it all right um so people talking about hydrating grain in the cooker the pressure cooker so i guess no soak methods that's what i've switched over to with doing the five pound grain um so you have to be careful when that that grains or the pressure cooker is coming back down to zero. What I've found is if I let it cool too quickly, so I'll uh, put it in front of my flow hood. One of them is a, it has like a warmer fan. So I'll put it in front of that one now and it cools the grain a lot slower than if I put it in my other corner of my lab, which is kind of cooler. And if it cools too quickly, it will pull different pockets out of the bag. So that's one of the things I would be weary of is you don't want to cool the grain too quickly. Um, but with the all American, like he uses, I feel like it mitigates that with the, that, um, filter valve. Is that true? Um, it, it just has a weight that holds the vacuum. Yeah. So, um, all Americans are a little bit better for that, I guess, but the Presto still works. Um, and then definitely don't ever open it when, before it hits zero, um, or you're going to have issues there and it could be very dangerous so just be careful if you're if you're hydrating your grains don't let them cool too quickly and um yeah it's always better to do the the soaking methods Mm -hmm. because you'll get better results but it takes a lot of time and i've been messing with the no soak methods and uh, i think there's a way to get it to where you like it but if you're wanting perfect results, you really need to do some sort of a soaking method. Mm-hmm. Either bring it to a boil and then let it soak in hot water or let it soak overnight. Yeah, I definitely prefer doing that, especially when I'm doing breeding or something where I know, like I don't know how the mycelium could handle over overly dry or overly wet grain. But after you're working with the same strain for a while, you kind of can test the limits. Um, All right, guys, any more questions? 
once again, um, if you're in Denver or if you want to visit Denver, we loaded up our full schedule for mushroom cultivation classes on mushroomcult.net. There's one space left in November, December sold out, and then we have some online classes that are scheduled, um, starting to fill those. And then also we're going to be doing the two day classes all the way through April. So come, um, you know, spend a weekend and learn how to grow mushrooms. Or even if you know how to grow mushrooms, there's still a lot of value that you can gain by, you know, being with a group of people. We, we spend a lot of time just talking over these issues that we're talking about now. And, um, I feel like it's it's very fun, and um, I'm I'm looking forward to it myself. Nah. Someone yeah. was asking about uh, testing for different uh, mushroom compounds. Did you find mm. a lab that does it? Yeah. So that is has been very frustrating about finding a reliable lab. I've I've probably communicated with five or six labs. I've sent in samples to two labs, and I've yet to see any results. Um, so if anyone knows, you know, a reliable lab out there that will um, deliver the results, I'm still waiting. Um, there's a place in Utah that seemed very promising, and I sent them some some uh, product, and I just never got any results back. So, so my my theory is that um, it's probably very expensive to calibrate and maintain these instruments. So all these labs that are starting to pop up that are, you know, diving into this realm, um, they're probably not getting the consistent, um, you know, samples that they need. So that was one of the, the uh, goals with the Denver Mushroom Cooperative is to set up this public lab that people could get their stuff tested. But as far as um, testing for specific compounds with HPLC and mass spec, I haven't had anyone follow through. Um, I know that... There's a place in California that is doing it. They just haven't responded back. Um, and I feel like they're probably just overwhelmed because of the demand. But um, I did find a lab that's doing all of the shelf stability and the safety testing. So testing for pesticides and um, uh, pH stability and any contamination and that is like the FDA requirements, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a lab still that will go above and beyond and, you know, test for cordycepin or hericinones. Um, and as far as I know, there's no one out there that has uh, provided results yet. All right, so someone says, do we sell agar? So we have pre-poured plates at Lion's Main Equipment and Supply in Denver. I was selling it on Etsy, but it's crazy with everything that's going on um, in recent times with with shipping. So I had so many problems with shipping that I stopped doing that, and now I, I only support local. But um, I remember you were doing it at some point. Do you still do pre-poured? No. Um, there's a company, Tip of the Cap, they have. Yeah, Tip of the Cap, Mike Tyson. He does $1 plates. Um, just be weary because shipping is just out of control. There's a lot of damage um, these days. And I think it's just better to pour it in your own lab anyway. All right, um. sell spores in Britain. So I don't sell spores, but we do sell cultures on Etsy. And back in July, they changed some of the regulations, so we are shipping to the UK. Um, they, you know, they haven't had any problems. So if you check out our Etsy Fresh Fungi, we are selling cultures, but I don't do spores just because um, I I go through a lot of work to get a really refined culture. So I'd rather just sell good product than you know rolling the dice with spores. Uh oh, asking the unaskable question. Um, you can't ask where he gets his boxes. You can't. Oh yeah, I don't. I don't do sources mostly because I change them a lot, but also because that's something you have to figure out yourself. <laughs> yep. 
But if you are going to package mushrooms, I recommend do, using cardboard. Um, cardboard is way better than brown bags, in my opinion. It just holds up better. But you want to use paper, um, something that the mushrooms can breathe. And then there are many different places you can find boxes. Um, but yeah, you're going to have to find that yourself. Are you shipping mushrooms and somebody is talking about using hay or straw in place of cocoa? Yeah, you can use hay, straw, mm -hmm. and mix it with manure. Yep, that's um, pretty common. Are you too. shipping mushrooms? So am I shipping mushrooms? I'm shipping freeze-dried mushrooms right now. We did do some test rounds with, um, with forage.market. I did ship a few different varieties we're trying to figure out what works best the lion's mane came out good king oyster came out good the piapino and chestnuts just got destroyed i'm just weary about shipping anything these days because it could take even overnights are taking three or four days so if someone's paying fifty dollars for overnight and they don't get it you know five, for four or five days then it's worthless to me because I don't want to eat that cost and I don't want people to pay for something that's just not happening. So once our economy kind of comes back to life, I will consider shipping fresh mushrooms or if we can figure out a better system than what we have now. But for now, freeze dried is what I'm shipping and um, I'm going to reconsider once the, the market season ends. But my experience is that even if you pay premium shipping, it's not a guarantee, so um, yeah. So that's where I where I am with that. So someone's asking about substrate pasteurization. Um, it depends on what you're doing. Like if you're doing mm -hmm. um, masters mix in with hardwood, you really need to sterilize it. So that needs to be. Um, mm -hmm. They were suggesting 200 degrees. You need to get to 250, 250. which is 15 psi or higher. Yep. And, or you can do atmospheric, but it has to be a really long time because mm -hmm. you have to have enough time for any spores to germinate and get killed. Um, which takes about 20 hours. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you're doing straw or low supplemented things, you can just pasteurize them for sure. Um, freeze dryer. Highly recommend, uh, uh, Harvest Right. They're American and they, they, like, I have got mine less than a year ago, and there's probably two models past the one that I bought. So, uh, Harvest Right, I, I will stand by them uh, through and through. I haven't had any issues, and like I said, within eight months, they already have two better models out there. All right, so I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, you guys can tune in to Fungi Friday. I'm going to be doing these more regularly now that the market season's coming down. We've got a couple lined up. Um, so next week, I'm going to be talking with uh, Sarif from Mystic Mountain Mushrooms up in Granby. He is a former student of ours, and I'm looking forward to hearing you know, about his journey. Um, and then also, I'm supposed to be sitting down with uh, Michael Nail from Mile High Fungi and Conifer. So some local farmers, um, I can't wait to talk with them. And then, like I said, we're going to be teaching classes with Zach here. And definitely check out his channel, Mushroom Cult. Um, he's got a really good series on how to clean up spores. Um, we're both on TikTok. My video? Yeah. Um, <laughs> aseptic in a septic world. Check yeah, it out. don't Check watch it out. that one. <laughs> Check it out. Yeah. All right. But I appreciate you guys. Um, yeah. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to email us. Um, Zach's Mushroom Cult. And then I'm Fresh from the Farm Fungi. Um, and check out our Etsy, Fresh Fungi. He sells his uh, lids that he makes. And then I sell my cultures. And we both got swag. So if you want one of these cool shirts, check out his website, Mushroom Cult. My stuff um, is up on Etsy, and you got new, new. Um... Yeah, I recommend the white shirt. Um, I'm still trying to figure out about like the whole printing stuff, and I don't, 
I don't really make money on any of that stuff, but I think it's cool. So, um, yeah, if you want a cool mushroom shirt, um, definitely check out one of our websites and um, stay tuned. We're going to be doing some more videos. And uh, if you haven't signed up to our class, they're selling out quickly. So I highly recommend um, signing up sooner than later. All right, guys, Till next time, much love.